Welcome back to Senate Education, Friday, February 3rd. Uh, policy committees and appropriation committees, the Appropriations Committee in the Senate, there's, there's always this uh, working together during the session for us to understand what requests are and for Appropriations Committee to get an understanding from us, our thoughts on different requests. Some committees, some policy committees do it more than others. I tend to like the education committee to know what's happening in the budget to see if uh, you know anything is, you know, comes out as a concern or something people might, you know, be particularly supportive of and then share those notes with Senator Kitchell. So, uh, and then there will be things that will come up during the year that people will want to get money for particular ideas, whether you know it's school safety, school construction, miscellaneous education bill, other work we might uh, uh, work on. So, without having gone through the budget myself yet, I will be completely honest here. Uh, I thought let's have you all in to just give us an overview of the educational components of the budget, of the uh, budget adjustment bill. Okay. Um, Senator, would you like to hear, so we, we sort of have two pieces. Yeah, uh, there's the there's the dollars, the, the numbers in the sense, and that would be uh, and sorry, Jill Briggs Campbell Agency of Education for the record, that would be Sean and Brad. And then there's a second piece, which is some change in language. Uh, and that would be my piece. So you you pick your poison, whatever you'd like to hear first. Yep. Uh, tell us which of you makes sense to go first. Sean, why don't you go? I'm going to volunteer Great. you all. I'll be happy to. <laughs> I'm um, Sean Cousineau, the Deputy CFO with the Agency of Ed. Um, so thanks for having us in your, your committee today. Um, so myself, Brad, and Jill are here. Um, Brad and I are going to share um, about the FY22 carry forward and um, the money coming into our 23 budget from last year. Um, would you like, do you have the slides or would you like to share? Um, we have the slides in front of us. Okay. All right. Um, so we can start sliding through mine. So we're going to talk about the general fund carryover and revision on slide two, our agenda. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Brad and he'll take care of the education fund. Um, and we're happy to take questions at any time. Um, and we can skip right to slide five now. Okay. Um, this is our finance and administration um, appropriation. And we're looking at carry forward for purchase orders of 19,600 and um, carry forward of 52,000 and reverting $282. So the, the 52,000 um, was to cover a shortfall in our 23 budget. Um, based on the ups and downs from last year. Um, any questions on this one? This is our, our you know, secretary's budget, our CFO's budget, legal. Um, they're all within this, this appropriation. We'll stop you when we have questions. Sounds good. Um, our next appropriation is education services. This, um, and we're looking at a small purchase order order um, carryover, much larger general fund carryover, 462,000 and we're reverting um, 3,800. So we've got, again, 44,000 for a shortfall in our FY23 budget, um, 230,000 um, for subgrant obligations and several other little initiatives um, that have been approved um, by the administration. Um, next, we've got the adult ed and flexible pathways appropriations. For adult ed, we're carrying over 262,000 for grant obligations and reverting 7192. Flexible pathways, we're carrying forward 600,000 for um, our dual enrollment programs, spring semester obligations. 
And we have a question from Senator Hashim. Uh, just sure. a uh, elementary question here, no pun intended, but reversion, What? can you explain to me what reversion is? Sure. Um, so at, at the end of the fiscal year, you know, we, we'll have a balance in our general fund and certain appropriations. Um, if we have a, a use for it or an obligation for it and the administration approves the carryover, that's our carry forward number. And then if there's still money left after we carry forward some that we haven't identified a need for, um, we're gonna revert that money back in this case to the general fund. Um, and that the same same thing goes for the ed fund, sure. Um, so yeah, flexible pathways were reverting um, 182,000. Um, next up is the state board. Um, there's a, a small appropriation here, and we've got a small purchase order for going into FY23, and we're carrying forward ten thousand dollars for anticipated extra legal expenses. And we're reverting fifty-four thousand seven fifty-five, um, and that wraps up the Ed Fund or the General Fund. Um, next up is the Education Fund, and Brad, I'll take the first one. Um, so back in the Finance and Administration um, appropriation, there's Ed Fund in that appropriation as well, and we're looking to carry forward. 250,000 for purchase orders and reverting 1.6 million. And then that leaves us on slide 11. And then and that's right, that's right. <laughs> Okay, good afternoon. Brad James, Agency of Education. Lovely to see you all again. Great to see you. As always. But somebody came in. I was wondering if anybody's going to be here today. <laughs> so, um, so we are now on slide number eleven, um, and this is one of the big, bigger numbers here that we're talking about here. Uh, oh, by my slides in the right place too. Um, this is the special ed formula, and and what this covers. This covered. This covered the this the census. Um, what what was now the census block grant, but was uh, reimbursement the mainstream block grants um, extra, and extraordinary expenditures for special education? As you're all aware, we went from a a reimbursement model to a census block model this year. Um, I, at least I think you're aware. If not, I'll be happy to explain. Um, and that was supposed to start back in FY18, <laughs> um, or actually when, when Act 173 passed, it was, it was supposed to start in FY20, I think. Um, and what happens is when we're doing a reimbursement model, what we're doing is we're, we're repaying the prior year's costs. We're kind of truing up, in other words, we're advancing people money during the course of the year, and then they tell us what they actually spent, and we're truing it up. And, and that's usually a, a big number that we end up doing in the following fiscal year. So what happens is that becomes part of the uh, next appropriation. What, what occurs with federal folks, with IDA especially, is there's a requirement to meet for federal maintenance of effort for us to maintain the same level of special, uh, special education spending. So being aware that special education costs are going up and the census block grant was going to actually be less money than what we were reimbursing, we want to try to offset that increase. And so we took more money forward and kept pushing it forward, carrying it forward. Um, so that we could kind of buy down that and not have us a really high number here that we couldn't meet. You know, in this, it wasn't what the census block grant. Census block grant finally started this year for the first time was postponed. Um, so, you know, our numbers were way off. So we had money left over and we didn't need it all because the cost came in lower than we anticipated. Additionally, in the last four or five years, um, the supervisory unions, which is where special education costs take place, have overestimated what they were actually going to spend, or what they actually ended up spending, I should say. So what we do when we're coming into the appropriation time is we ask for what we think they're going to be spending based on what they're telling us. And when they come in lower, we have extra money left over. So that's kind of a lot of what you're seeing here is those, those two things right here. That the, so we're, we're reverting, giving back to the end fund $27.3 million okay, that, that we don't need. We're carrying forward a fairly large piece. We're carrying forward about $31.2 million, $31.3 million 
And that, that's, I, we hopefully we won't need it all, which means we revert it next year. Um, but basically what we've done now is we've gone from the census block grant, or pardon me, from the reimbursement model the census block grant. And there are a number of districts saying that's not going to be enough money for it. So if, it's, if, if the special education aid doesn't help them out, then what happens is that falls directly onto the education spending because they have to pay for it anyway. And then it falls directly onto their tax rate. Senator, what your question? I think Brad might, Mr. James might be getting to it. Maybe. Yeah, you're definitely in the realm. Well, Senator Week, if you don't have one, Senator Weeks, go ahead. So just out of curiosity on the special education formula slide. So the 27 million that is, re is re re reverse, reverting or right. reversing? Right, we're giving it back. Right. To the education, education fund? fund? Okay. Yeah, this, everything I'm talking about now is education. Okay. So Sean, Sean was talking about general fund. Okay. I'm on the education fund. Uh, now, I, now it's clear. Yeah. Senator Quillen. Thank you. Um, so I guess that then I do have a question because um, your question sparked mine. Um, I, I guess I'm confused as to why we're reverting 27 million when we know that schools weren't didn't get enough money. Well, that's that's part of what we're estimating that 31 million full carry forward to be. We're, we're we're taking again. We had a pot of money of if my math is around 50, 58,000 yeah. 58 million dollars. Yeah. Okay, that that was sitting there from from last year. Mm -hmm. We 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 didn't need. I have to keep looking. We didn't need just over twenty seven million of it. That's the reversion. That's what we're giving back to the education fund. Drops to the bottom line was incorporated into the tax commissioner's December one letter by statute. Um, and then I saw that. <laughs> and then and then that left us with this thirty one million. And we're going to use that if necessary for a variety of purposes. Which I'll explain in just a moment. Okay. Because I think that you were asking. Okay. Senator Williams and Senator. Thank you. So, who gets these block grants? They go to the supervisory. Okay. The, 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 the census block grant, just very briefly, is, is based on a three year average of money that the state was spending out, was paying out to people. And it's divided by an average, average daily membership count, a three year average daily membership count. That gave us a block grant. What the law says is in FY27, everybody will be at the same block grant. Currently, they're not. So some are high, some are low. So we have a four-year transition as they're going from where they are in FY23 to FY27. So some are coming down by equal increments to four years. Some are going up by equal increments. It's, it's different. The increments are different for every school district. Okay. But it's going, it's going to. So what's happening is now the block grant is going out based on the pupil count, the total pupil count. It's actually an average, but the total pupil count instead of looking at what they really spent on just special education and reimbursement. Does that help? Okay. Sorry. Okay. So we're, we're oh, I just, sorry. That's, that's I, quite uh, right. I, I don't mind being interrupted. Okay, sure. uh, so with, with reversion, I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around some things here, but re with reversion, these funds are going back into the ed fund. Yes. Are they pre-assigned for this upcoming year? Is it just, it, are we, they, yet to figure out where the, these monies are going. It, it, it's, it's up to the legislature to decide what to do with these uh, okay. quote unquote surplus funds. I mean, that's another way of thinking about it. It's a surplus rolling forward. It's, so that, that's what their version is, giving money back to the Ed Fund. But what, what the December 1 letter from the tax commissioner does, it, put, it sets out the recommendations for the property yield, which drives homestead property tax rates, the income yield, which gives people the discount, the, the tax credit on their homestead property tax for, and then the non-homestead tax rate. So, so that's the December one that's doing. What he's doing, what, yeah, this heat this year, um, it has been for a few years. Um, what, what he is doing is, is looking, and this is statutorily done, he's looking at what we think is going to happen with the education, what the demands are going to be on the education fund, and how much money is coming into it. So there, there are things that are not property tax in the education fund, like the, the um, sales and use tax person, use meals and room, Medicaid transfer and the lottery, things like that. We kind of know what's going on. But if, if this is what we need the education fund and those pieces I just mentioned come to here, we still have to fill that gap. And that's property tax, either homestead or non-homestead. So that's what his December 1 letter is doing is looking at what we think is going to happen. And he's making estimates of what the yields need to be to bring in the right amount of money uh, for the homestead side and what the non-homestead property tax needs to be to bring in the right amount of money for the um, non-homestead side. And what, he, what the law says to do is it says to take any 
surplus <laughs> and any money sitting at the bottom of the education level, which, which are these numbers we're talking about right now, and use those in terms of determining what those yields and that, that non homestead property tax rate should be. So they've been used up in his December 1 letter, which came out and said, you know, even though tax, tax rates are going to go down, overall taxes will be going up because of property values and such. Um, but he, he came out with yields that, that school boards are looking at, business managers are looking at set people's tax rates right now. Had he not used those, those numbers at the bottom, then the, the yields would have been lower because there wouldn't have been as much money, so tax rates would have been higher. It's kind of an inverse relationship. It's an inverse relationship. Um, so that, that's, that's where the money is. It, it's up to you all as, as a large body to decide what you want to do with those funds. But they're, they're sitting there right now to be used. That's, that's where we're at. Are you good? Oh, yeah. Sure. Yep. Okay. Just so, means, so, so maybe a follow on to Senator Hashim's uh, uh, point uh, and for clarification from the chairman, because you're more experienced with this than us. Are those reversions now accounted for in the BAA? Are those funds now uh, allocated, you know, theoretically? What passed out of the house? What? Right. That passed out of the house, or I'm not sure if it's passed out of the house yet, but. Uh, are they already accounted for in, in the BAA? That's correct. I'm okay. back. They, I, are, I, um, I, they should, they should they be in the BAA be, yeah. because we're saying we're giving this money back. We want to carry this forward. Yeah. So I think that would be part of uh, yeah. the answer to your question. Yeah. Again, I have, I have not looked at the BAA either, <laughs> um, full disclosure, but I'm not shocking. <laughs> and I just, just to go back to why I, I like to do this with committees, when I sometimes when you're on a policy committee and they start talking about budget issues, it was always frustrating to me not to have kind of understood. Different committee chairs handle it differently. Some people love to jump into the budget. Some people say that's appropriations. If this committee could just, it's important for me to just, you all just generally know it. So if you see something, we can try to do something about it. You can have a conversation with appropriations. What is it? Knowledge is power, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing. Uh, yes, Ted. For the record, Ted Fisher, my name is of Education, I'm the agency director of communications and legislative affairs. I just did want to know that this language is in the VA, but is it coming to you. It must be on its way down the stairs way, yeah. Yeah. from or across the hall. Um, uh, and and this we have given we give a similar presentation to House Education after we presented to House Appropriations, and my colleagues gave a presentation to Senate Appropriations earlier this week. So we're kind of taking the rounds around as, as following the bill. So, Senator Williams, thank you. Well, I'm trying to understand the budget process yeah. because I'm used to, I'm, not, I'm from the other end of it, that, at the municipal level. It's like I asked the question of our school board because during COVID, nobody was in school. Yet you're still asking for this much money that they didn't use. Does that go back into yes. the surplus? So, I'm used to use you either use it or you lose. Well, yeah, that's not that's not okay. the case because this is all state money. Okay. Um, it's already generated. Right. Ba ba basically, basically, the education fund works differently than pretty much every other fund in in the in the state and anywhere else for that matter. Probably in in all the other funds, basically, you look at how much money you have and say, "This is what we're going to do with it." In the education fund, the school districts make the decision basically as to how much money they're going to spend. It's a local decision. You know, for all the, all the districts, and the state's obligation is to fund it. So, so it's it's reversed, and and so that 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 makes it that makes it different. So when when we appropriate the money in, in the big bill or through the BAA, um, basically what we do is is we're making our best estimates as to what we need, and then if we don't need it, we're, this is what the process would go through. We're, we're we're reverting back what we don't need. We're giving it back so they can use it the following year or we're carrying some form because we still need that much money for X, Y, and Z. Good question. Yeah, so all that's good questions. I mean, this is, this is not straightforward. You haven't done it yeah, before. No, yeah. So I, I think your approach is good. <laughs> Helps me too. <laughs> so. Okay, so are we set? And I'll continue on. This is what we're gonna hope to use, what this 31 million is for. Okay, so, so again, as I said, this is the first year of the census block grant. A number of districts don't think that's going to be enough money for them. So one of the charts that, that we're supposed to do, and I'm slow in doing, I have the data, I have that time to spend to do it, is to look at high spending uh, 
supervisory use. High, when I say high school, I mean in terms of um, special education. And then to see what's happening, is this going to be enough money for them or not? And then, and you know, make a recommendation that will come back to you. So that's that. So that's if, if we decide we need more money, then we're, we're covered here. This costs have also been going up across the board from what people have been telling me. I'm not a special education expert by any means, but costs have been going up across the board um, in terms of more kids needing more services, more to do with the pandemic in, in a lot of cases, um, but also because people, I think somebody mentioned it earlier, it's hard, it's one of the independent people, it's hard to find people right now, so people have to pay more to get people, so those costs are going up. Services that when, when you have high cost kids, those prices are going up, they're going up across the board. I've also been told by business managers, because I asked the question, because somebody had asked me, is our extraordinary, the, is the total cost and count of kids for extraordinary expenses going up? I'll explain that in a second. Is, is that going up? They're saying, yes, it is going up like that. When I say extraordinary expenses, basically, if, if we go back to the reimbursement model, just to kind of understand it, what the state did was we refunded roughly 56% of special education costs for, for most people. If districts, districts, supervisor unions had a student who's had high costs that exceeded $60,000, then they paid 56% of that $60,000. And then the state picked up 95% of the amount over $60,000. And those are the extraordinary costs we're talking about. Okay, so anything over at this point, 60,000, I think next year from 24, it's inflation takes up to like 66,200, something like that, somewhere in that range. Um, and again, that's statutory inflation. But that's what I mean when I'm saying extraordinary costs. So more and more kids seem to be coming into that category, even though the cost, the level is going up and the costs themselves are going up. Okay, so, so that's, so again, we're trying to build a bit of a cushion in here. So we don't come back and say, well, we, we were wrong. We need more money saying here we, we got too much and give it back to you. Um, there's another piece in the in in statute for unexpected and I wrote it down because I remember unexpected and unusual circumstances. And if districts, if LEAs, supervisor unions, so I'll get one or the other out there. If supervisor unions um, are experiencing unusual or unexpected costs, they can ask us for additional funds. So we anticipate that will happen some this year. So this is what we're kind of take using this money for, or we're kind of building up a, a reserve for these anticipated things coming our way, we think this year. That's that's why that number is so high, otherwise we give it back. A lot of words, sorry. <laughs> what page is that on? Um, that's number 11, slide 11. It's a B502 special education program. Thank you. So what governs what you can do with the surplus? Is there, are there rules for, for, for the agency of education? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I think there's some, I think it's, it's somewhere in the finance administration. We, we have to give it back. I mean, we, you know, we, we, you give it, when you're giving us appropriation, you're giving us authority to spend money. And if we don't need it, then we can't spend it because the fiscal year ends. And so it's, it's just money sitting there. We can't do anything with it. Um, but where that authority is, I don't know the answer to that. Find that out from which council. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. yeah. Finance and management probably knows. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, anything else on special education? Okay. Okay. Then we're on state place students. It's students, partly with the slide twelve. Um, again, state place students. Um, we're giving back one point four million dollars. We're asking to carry forward five million dollars. And again, same idea. We're getting we're getting not necessarily more students, but they seem to be costing more for the state place students. The lines are going out of state, um, and th and there's those costs are coming in quite high because we have no no say in what they're what we're being charged. So we want to make sure that we have the sufficient funds to cover that. Um, so this is a lot of this covers state place for special education purposes, but also for regular state place purposes too. That's what this whole appropriation did. The $5 million get us, giving us a little cushion because we're not sure what's happening. So those are some special ed kids, but are those also kids who want to go to Europe for no. a term? No. no. Okay. No. So, no. The, 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 those are regular tuition kids. What, what we're talking here with state place kids are people who are removed from their families by DCF. Okay. That, that's that's who we're talking about, and they're placed somewhere where their parents don't live. The, the, the law has changed a little bit. It's not, and it's not just. And the reason for the committee that I asked this last year, this committee put 
real parameters around where dollars go out of state. Um, and uh, I suspect we'll return to that. Yeah, because it didn't, it didn't yeah. go anywhere, as I recall. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so, so we, we do have a lot of kids going to, again, they're going to therapeutic schools, but they're going yeah. out of state. Um, and, and, and we're talking about high end, high cost therapeutic schools in, in many, many cases and in lots of different states, too. Um, you know, it's ideally it'd be nice to have them all here in Vermont, but we don't have the facilities. Yeah. Anything else in the state place? All right, flexible pathways. Um, again, there, there, are two, there are two parts to flexible pathways for dual enrollment specifically. Dual enrollment has a, a uh, it's, it's funded 50% from the general fund, which the part Sean was talking about earlier, and 50% from the education fund, and that's statutory. From the general fund, it's coming from the, or I guess it's not the general fund part, it's the next generation initiative fund. I think it's its own separate fund. So um, we're giving back 1.8 million, we're, we're, care, we're asking to carry forward roughly 1.5. Um, and the, the, there's, we never really know how many kids are going to go into early college. The numbers have been going up. Uh, we don't always know how many kids are going to do enrollment. Those numbers tend to go up too. And those are all costs. To the economy. There's high school completion, which is not growing like the other two. I do know because I looked for early college, um, this year versus last year, last year, we had just under 300 early college students this year, we have just over 400. So those, those numbers are going up and it, we're talking. $8,000 a year for, for, for 100 kids. So that's, it's, it's a lot of money. You know, it's not poorly spent by any means, but it's, it, but it's a lot of money. So that's why we're carrying some money for over here. We're not sure what happens because we don't know until it's doing it. Just to remind us, early college can be CCB, state colleges, UVM, St. Mike's. Yep. 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 It, it, it can be anything. And dual yep. enrollment is, is kind of the same. Yep. Um, dual enrollment, just to make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, 11th and 12th graders can take up to two years of college credits while they're in, in school or through the summer for dual enrollment. And then some students who are 12th graders, if they so choose, can disenroll from a high school and enroll in college full time. And that's what early college is. So they can get a year's worth of credit if they do the right courses. We'll hear more about that on Thursday. Thank you. Slide 14, the education spending grant. Um, we're asking carry for a million dollars, carry for pardon me, a million dollars, which is roughly what I think we usually ask the most most years, if I recall correctly. We're reverting 11.75, um, and that that's much larger than normal. And the reason for that is because of how the law is constructed when a district fails its budget. Um, when a district fails its budget, what the law says is that we 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 pay that district. A certain percentage of, a, of amount, a certain amount of money per student, per equal student specifically, but per student. South Burlington's budget failed in FY21, I think it was, um, and there that that payment I just mentioned because they have a lot of kids turned out to be 6.8 million dollars. So we sent them 6.8 million dollars because that's what the law said to do. It turns out that that year that that year. South Burlington, because of its property values, specifically its non-property, homestead property values, was able to raise more money than their school district needed. And again, these are education fund dollars, all of them. And so they sent the excess to the state and we never sent them any money. So they had $6.8 million sitting there. So we had we got $6.8 million back and that's part of this 11.7. So we're really talking about a more normal size reversion of about $5 million when we account for that 6.8. And that, and that five minutes is still a little bit high, but not that high. And I kind of felt like that was my fault. So I think I might have missed some figuring out that one out, realizing it's happening. But uh, small schools grant, um, small schools grant is also kind of the same as merger support grant. Um, just to r remind people or explain very briefly, um, school districts get a get a small schools grant if they met certain criteria. Basically, the, the main criteria is if your two-year average enrollment per grade is 20 or less on average. Okay, that's, that's the criteria. If we went through lots of unifications and mergers, as you all recall, um, it was very calm and relaxing. Um, yeah. We went through <laughs> I'm still feeling the scars. <laughs> um, we went through a number of mergers. And when, when small school districts merge into a unified union school district, meaning it's simply union district for grades pre-K through 12, um, what the law said 
was if they if those districts received two, a small schools grant two years prior, they brought it forward to as a merger support grant for the new unified district. And they're able to keep that money in perpetuity until you guys change your mind or until they close the building that brought that money or if they if they do a, a renovation the combined schools and renovation that building until they till the bond is the renovation bond is paid off. So basically this money the, the small schools grant cost is kind of leveled out. We're carrying forward $150,000 because now Lincoln has become its own small school. Um, and so this is this should cover them. That's kind of what we're looking at here. Um, in uh, just so you all are aware, in FY25, when the new weights come into play, small school grants for this, for the small school grant per se will be gone. Merger support grants will stay, the small schools grant will be gone, but it'll be merger support grant. And the reason behind that is because in the new weights for the pupils, there is a component for small schools or small yeah, schools. Yeah. And I think that was the last, well, oh no, it's technical education, sorry. Um, so we're on slide 16, technical education. We, and this is, this is, these are probably normal numbers on an annual basis. We're giving back about $1.5 million. We're carrying forward $412,000 um, for obligations that we have. Basically what, what this money does is it covers, it covers salary assistance for, for special education, or not special education, pardon me. Career Technical Center education, let's try English brand. Career Technical Center directors, co-op people, guidance counselors, possibly assistant directors. Um, so that, that's who, that's who this, the losses we give aid to. So this, this, this appropriate is doing that. We always, it also covers transportation for technical centers. So we always overestimate a little bit on that one because we don't know how many people are going to be asking for this money because some of it depends on the size or whether they have the position or not. So basically what we do is that annually, and this is historically, we, we basically increase the prior years by 5%. And that has always given us enough money to be able to fund this and we give the rest back the next year. Then I think that was the last slide. Questions for Mr. James, that's very helpful. Um, I haven't looked at text. Um, yeah. okay. It's related to this, and I don't you, really understand oh. it, so, but I think you probably will. Uh, I, guess I might have a text here. It's near the line. Uh, yeah, I think it's maybe chat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's it, it's it's true. I'm true. not a compliment. If, if, if I, that, <laughs> I'm, I'm used to that. Yeah. Uh, no, remember, my, remember my I'm job? I'm not quite is? sure I'm following it all. So, uh, so on uh, on budget adjustment, she's saying SR 11 acts looking for flexibility on 67 meals, 72 facilities, 28 literacy, 112 mental health, and Ed 166 radon. That's me. Oh, that's that's <laughs> going to be yes. Okay, she, she's she's yeah. right. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> Senator Bullitt, for raising this. Uh, yeah. Great, okay. terrific. It's Jill. All right, uh, again, thank Jill you. Briggs Campbell, Agency of Education, and my cat Susie sitting next to us, who just mm. got disturbed and was very upset. Uh, so. Um, I did just get confirmation from Ted that the uh, the proposed language that I'll be discussing today went through kind of exactly as is through the house. So we're yeah. talking about the same language. Um, and as Senator Lyons pointed out, this is uh, exactly exactly what she described, which is within the ESSER state set aside dollars. So you'll recall from a few weeks back when I was in person and we talked about with our ESSER funds, those COVID oh. federal emergency funds, 90% of the funds go down to the district. So we're not talking about those. We're talking about the 10% of the funds that remain at the state level. And over the past two years or so, uh, the legislature has appropriated those funds through, you'll see a, a grab bag of acts there that are listed on uh, slide number three um, for various purposes. Uh, and then once sort of the priorities or specific, very specific sometimes use of funds have been laid out, the agency has undertaken to carry out those programs. 
um, we have between all three funds, and remember ESSER one finished in September of 2022, but across all three, we have something like 40 separate initiatives. Uh, so we've been busy, busy. And what we're looking at now is um, as a reminder, the ESSER $2 end in September of 2023 and the ARP or ESSER $3 end in September of 24. So as we are engaging in this work, you know, putting out RFPs, getting contract bids, uh, putting out grant programs, making awards, trying to hire personnel or contractors or whatever it may be, um, there's a need to sort of reconcile any funds in a specific appropriation that are available still. So we, we have a budget for a contract of $500,000. We put out an RFP, it comes back at 450,000. That's great, except that because of the specific appropriations, the agency doesn't have the flexibility then to take that extra $50,000 and repurpose it within the broader legislative or, um, uh, priorities that have been outlined. So what we're asking for is essentially some language in the BAA that will give us the ability to do that. And I, I will tell you just from personal experience that I think I've answered about five emails today, just today that have said something along the lines of, I could move that around, but we have to wait for the BAA language. <laughs> So um, you'll see it's, it's a pretty simple piece of, of language here. It's identifying all of the acts where the ESSER state set aside dollars have been appropriated. It identifies um, some checkpoints that the agency is happy to report to the Joint Fiscal Committee in October of 23 and October of 24, giving sort of a status check. And um, the rest of the slides, I'll just sort of say, I provided um, so that you had sort of some insight and you've got this in another slide deck as well, uh, but some insight into the work that's underway. Um, but I would sort of point to um, slide number six, uh, which is sort of pointing to why this is really necessary right now. So if you asked me the question today, exactly how many dollars are we talking about here? My answer would be, I'm roughly estimating across the $44 million, something like maybe two to 3 million. But I can't give you anything more concrete than that. And that's because even today, we have eight live grant programs, uh, including programs where we have, um, we're making awards, like even, even as we speak, folks are working on that right now. And we have 12 live or planned contracts, meaning the RFPs are going out, the contract work is underway. So we also are using, um, within our sort of state set aside, there's a subcategory that's called the, the admin. And that is funds that are reserved to the agency to administer the essentially almost half a billion dollars that's come into the state. Um, and right now, if we had any um, uh, unused funds there because they were specifically appropriated, we can't move them back up into the state uh, sort of set aside and use them for statewide initiatives. So that would also um, give the flexibility to be able to do that. Uh, I will also just point out on slide six that all but 365,000 of that 44 million, and actually Sean and I met yesterday, it's all but 165,000 of that 44 million is budgeted for a purpose. So we are moving forward, we have plans for it all, but if we can, you know, kind of do those reconciliations and be able to gather up the money and then repurpose it for things that you've already identified are priorities. And the, the really, the, the rest of the slides is, is just a summary of the work that we're doing. So I'm happy to answer questions about them. I, I don't yeah, think I need to yeah. present on them, but yeah, go ahead. Great. This uh, question, please. This question may be for you, Chair. Robert. Okay. Is this so? Is this language that will fall under our purview? Is this what are we doing this work? 
We just want to make sure that yes, that's okay generally with the yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, I will also note that the language was drafted with the Joint Fiscal Office. So uh, Sarah Clark and Catherine Benham and I worked on it. We're not inventing a new wheel here. Uh, very similar language was used for the coronavirus relief funds. And there are other, there are ARPA SFRF programs that are using a similar kind of approach. So um, the agency is trying to kind of piggyback on some, some language and work that's already underway. Mr. Fisher. The record, Ted Fisher from my agency of education and the agency's director of communications and legislative affairs. Um, I just wanted to know for the committee's information, we have the, the X's on this slide because at the time there was not bill numbers because it's the governor's proposed language. Um, I sent the link to Hayden and, and Jill, Jill didn't mention the, the number, just section 57 of H1 45, which is on page 45. That's the BAA. Thank so you. Just for your, that's, that's where it is now. Do we have to vote on it? Yeah. Oh, no. The BAA? No, well, on the BA, I think. It's on this line. So. Yeah. so it all basically happened down the hall in probes. But if, for example, you saw it and thought, gosh, this is concerning, right? we, would, we would have a deeper community discussion and, and uh, oh. kind of a question for you. Yeah. Just you know, from I'm just thinking back to how the budget and the BAA was handled in the House when I was in the House and now here. I'm just curious, can you share about what this is going to look like over the next couple of months in terms of what is getting sent back to the House when we do our work here on the budget and the BAA? Yeah, so when we finish our work, you mean in the Senate, yeah. if, if there's any, of course, difference. There will be a committee of conference. I think there will be some sticking points. One thing that may be a problem might be, uh, as you probably have heard, uh, there's been a request for $9.2 million from organic farmers, kind of keep them going. Not sure if the Senate will agree with that. Uh, I could be misreading what people are saying. Some people said, well, maybe we'll wait and do that later when we really understand the, the situation. Uh, and so there may be a committee of conference over some of these things, sort them out. And then in terms of the budget itself, as you know, it, the governor has his budget out. It's in the House now. And then you can tell me if I'm not answering your question properly. No, you are. Okay. And then uh, once it comes to us after crossover, I'll ask for basically the same kind of thing that we're doing here for the agency to come in and say, hey, this is this is this is where we're at. This is where we'd like to be. This is where we may agree with the house or not agree with the house. And Senator Kitchell and Stephanie and I kind of try to just take in kind of just have a little bit of a conversation around are there particular items that we're all feeling we might be in disagreement with, are there particular things that might come out of a bill that we're gonna be funding for all that? Is that, is that helpful? Yep. And then it's um, it's a little, you know, back and forth, a little mm -hmm. crazy, but it, it works out. Yeah, you know, I don't need that in a really but it's just, uh, yeah, it's not good. Yeah. And I should mention this, Appropriations always has a liaison to, it, to the policy yeah. committee. It's been Senator Bruce since he was the chair of this committee. I think this time around it may be Senator Kirchley, which would be great because he was on this committee for a number of years and certainly knows what the priorities are. So we can't, you know, have that voice in there. Trying to help me understand the, the, the timelines for the budgets. I know the municipalities have got to have theirs done by. Town oh, meeting day, yeah, because they're gonna they're gonna vote on uh, the budget. But so the this, budget this, is the last thing we. I mean, when the budget's done, we're out of here, as everybody will tell you. Right. So uh, it is usually my experience has been that first second week in May. I don't know if that sticks with your experience as well when you're in the house. Uh, and if there, you, you'll see it slow down a little bit. If there's a big policy bill coming out, you know, if, if, if we're behind on 
for some reason, a huge bill that has to get out. Because when we go when the budget goes, uh, they might slow down a little bit to make sure the committee of jurisdiction or a policy committee uh, gets something out. For example, if we get into a big conversation around church and state, where we get into a big thing on school construction, and we're just not quite there, they might just slow it down so that you know we can finish our work. I'm just thinking yeah. it's kind of backwards. When the municipalities have to have their budget, they're getting federal funding for education, and we haven't even decided on the budget yet. Is that accurate or? No, I mean, we, uh, I'm looking to Mr. James. I mean, the big thing for municipalities or, or things that at least education policy is really setting the yield, right? I mean, that's. Right. right. And, and that's, and that really is, it, I mean, it, it will impact the town. <laughs> right. But it's, it's really the school districts who are, you know, it's their call yeah. as, as yeah. to what they're bringing to the voters. And then the yield will set the tax rate. For the towns, um, but again, you, you have no say in that. It's yeah. here, it's a pain of conflict. Yeah. Yeah. And then I will tell you later on this is how much money you need to raise because it's a grand list, etc. Took a while. Yeah, no, no, these are great it's, questions. It's not, straight, it's not as straightforward as town. Sure. And, you know, for what it's worth, uh, Senator, we are going to hear from Mr. Feldman next week as a follow up. One of the things that came out of yesterday's conversation was just some tax policy in Vermont versus other states he has a really interesting document. He's going to bring in comparing us to other states and we can maybe pull that apart. He might be a good person for us to ask some of these questions uh, as well. Okay. And the, the timeline, anticipated timeline for the BAA? So that, I think they will take a vote in appropriations uh, Friday or early next week. And I guess the House, uh, House. The House did it today on the floor. Yeah, the House did it today on the floor, it, and it's uh, on, our, on its way to us. So it's, it'll be on, um, it'll be assigned to appropriate, but appropriations have been generally working on it. You know, it's kind of what's coming. There have been conversations between Representative Lamper and Senator Kitchell. So I'm guessing it'll be on, our, on the floor for us to vote on as a Senate next Friday. It seems early, maybe the following early next week. Early the following week. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Am I missing anything? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. That sounds right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Senator Gould. Thank you, Chair. Did you respond, Jill, to the um, question that Senator Lyons had asked about the flexibility piece? Yeah, I, so I'm a I'm making an assumption here because we were in front of Senate appropriations just, um, what, two days ago, Brad? Tuesday. Yeah, uh, Tuesday. And um, so that that was exactly all of the numbers that she was rattling off were the were the specific acts that um, are listed in the 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 language in the BAA, and so the idea here is and and I can if we if you if you want we can dive in a little bit further. So if we look at um, say the slide number nine. Uh, and you look at community schools, which is Act 67, which was one of the ones that Senator Lyons was referencing, you'll see that the original appropriation was 3,399,000, and we have awarded or budgeted all of those funds. Um, if you look at the, uh, the ARP ESSER after school grants, those were appropriated in Act 185 last year, and those awards are being made uh, you know, even as we speak, I think our team is working on those. So those are ones that we we intend, you know, to fully award. Um, what we're looking at is places, particularly around um, some of the RFPs, the bids that are going to be going out. So the family literacy engagement, professional development, or um, some of our, our literacy initiative, professional development models, um, high quality instructional materials, those those bids are still in flight right now. So if, you know, by some, you know, strike of a fortune there, they came in under budget, we would want to try to be able to gather those funds back in and, and repurpose them. Uh, Act 72 is another place where there's uh, $4 million that was appropriated uh, through Act 72 of our Besser funds. That work is well underway. Uh, but it has very specific appropriation lines. And if there's uh, the ability to um, 
you know, we may not need a contractor that's a, that's a specific line if we can move it up into a different area of Act 72 that should be prioritized. We, we need the flexibility to be able to do that. And I think sort of the, the critical underpinning here and the, the message I guess would be, we don't want to be in a position where we are returning federal dollars. So mm -hmm. that's why that flexibility is needed. Right. So really the answer is yes, in terms of what, what we would say to Senator Lyons. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think she was just wondering like, yeah. what does the flip, what, I don't want to hold people up, but yeah, like? please ask how flexible, but it sounds like as flexible as needed, right? Yeah, and I would say if we have something like, for example, um, Senator Lyons was really involved in Act 112, which was the mental health grants and contracts. So yes. we take very seriously that that's a priority of the legislature. So when we have our, our grant program, which awards are being made right now, we found initially that we ended up with some funds um, still available, right? So the districts and, and non-district entities were asked to, you know, tell us what tell us what you need, and we ended up with some extra funds. And our program manager actually went back and spoke with the districts and spoke with the the non-LEA entities and said, "You've got a really promising thing here in your application." what if you had an additional $50,000? What could you do with it, you know, and please resubmit. So we're trying to ensure that we are fully awarding those funds. And at the same time, you know, if there's $2,000 left over, there's $2,000 left over. Um, and the same thing will happen with the, the contract for the direct mental health supports for educators and staff, that uh, those bids were due a couple of days ago. If they come in under, and we can use those funds to put more money into the grants, we we can't do that right now uh, because of the way they were specifically appropriated. So the intention is not to ever go outside of the legislative priorities. We're not gonna bring in a new thing. Um, we know what the state's priorities are and to stay within those boundaries, but to be able to um, maximize the benefit essentially. Joe, would you do us a favor and write to Senator Lyons just reference that, you know, we had a question, uh, Senators, uh, Senators, Senator Gulick raised your question. Please let me know if you have additional questions, if you want to clarify, just some kind of follow-up, maybe if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, would you, yeah, would you mind having Hayden give me the exact questions yeah. so that I can address it and make sure I, I hit all of her? Yeah. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah happy great. to. It's really great that you're making all these efforts to use those funds. Yeah, absolutely. And our, our program folks are really working very closely with the, with the districts and, and other entities right now to make sure we're maximizing. I just wanted to say, um, wearing my communications director hat, there are some extremely cool things. Mm -hmm. um, we are in the process of trying to highlight some of those very cool things that school districts are doing. Um, when I say cool, I mean, they're doing amazing things for kids, right? But some of them are like truly cool factor definition or are like good examples of innovation. So we're in the process of starting um, some work to try to highlight those as best practices and essentially provoke ideas, hopefully in peers and colleagues and also show the public what some of the good work that schools are doing. So my hope is, is that by the end of this month, we'll have one of the first examples of some things highlighting or to share that. That would be terrific. Yeah, yeah awesome. we would really welcome that. Absolutely. Yeah. Kudos to my colleague, Jill, for sending us the cool things. Way to go, Jill. <laughs> she, Way to go, Jill and Kitty. <laughs> yeah, and Susie has decided she absolutely has to be part of the testimony. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> thank you for joining us, Jill. Uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. James, as usual, Mr. Fisher, Ms. Briggs Campbell. Committee, uh, the, the agenda for next week is posted, has been posted. Take a look. There are going to be a few changes uh, that will give you a good sense of what we're going to be up to. And I think it kind of touches on people's questions and uh, all the way along. <clears throat> I would Again, just to review, I think we will have a school safety bill, miscellaneous, certainly a miscellaneous education bill, which will include some of these things possibly, as long as well as other things. 
that I'm working on with uh, Destiny James, and we'll share with everybody as soon as that's done. Universal Meals is something we're going to need to decide on. Uh, Senator, you, we are going to look to to maybe put the school construction in, just to get that would yeah. just, just to kind of get us, give us something. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. And Senator, if you don't want to put it in, uh, you could just always share the language just to give us something to I build off of. That, that would be yeah. great. And uh, we will be picking up not next week, but the following week, some of the work on the early childhood bill that all of you are working on, several of you are working on in the morning um, on in health and welfare. So, <laughs> all right. Kate and I are going to stick around for a little while. Uh, if anybody wants to hang out and